Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum Channel. Today is Monday, November 30th, 2020. Hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving that celebrates that here in the United States. Hope everyone had a great holiday. <clears throat> uh, good to be back with you all live. We got a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, a lot of space weather, Grand Solar Minimum related uh, topic, uh, definitely. But uh, let's start off with our space weather. Right now, we're sitting at 531.1 kilometers per second with a density of 13.4. Now, that is significant in a few ways. Uh, the solar wind speed is also, when we talk about the density here, where that's the uh, how it's carrying these highly charged particles within the solar wind. So there's a density. Obviously, if you're talking about a density of 1.5, it's a very low density. Uh, 13.4 is higher than usual and right now our atmosphere is getting bombarded by highly charged particles and large amounts of them in fact the cosmic rays uh, right now the dosage rate is sitting at 9.7 percent which is up 0.8 percent so it has definitely uh, we have seen a quite a uptick in everything and I'll get into that here in just a second so we take a look at the fact that we have elevated solar wind speeds right now we have one two three four five six sunspot groupings to label out we have outgoing AR 2783 uh, AR2785 uh, earth facing AR 2788 and AR 2786 and then we have in the northern uh, part of the star the northeastern part that is AR 2787 and then finally in the southern part that is just now turning away from the eastern limb is AR 2789 and right behind that is AR 2790 so it there is a very good chance that we will have seven sunspot groupings to talk about <clears throat> major uh wake-up call here for the sun now we are heading out of solar minimum but that happens over time right we see the uptick in activity as the years go by the sun continues to build up now we've had a very slow start to solar cycle 25 so to see it kind of uptick like this maybe it was just late getting things going and poof big explosion we'll go to the space weather section at our website too to find out what else is coming because right now it's busy <clears throat> but and then on top of that yesterday we had a major solar flare uh yesterday november 29th picked up a solar flare at m 4.4 that's pretty decent size nothing really crazy um, as far as any kind of uh, damage to the grid or anything like that this is mainly going to be uh, you know ham radio brownouts stuff like that but this was a pretty good CME and uh, we'll, we'll get into that here in a minute uh, KP indices are not one and two I do apologize for that they're currently sitting at a well actually a one and a three it was zero and three and we always talk about earth facing coronal holes and kp in the lower where it's always kind of that, that watch period and since we've had so much sunspot activity popping off earth facing right now too it isn't a surprise that we have had two earthquakes within the last two hours decent ones nothing crazy but strong nonetheless Let's finish up the space weather stats real quick. TCI down a little bit. It was at 6.1, now it's at 5.89. I expect that to go back up though, as we are expecting solar wind. And that should be arriving, uh, well, actually right now, we're, what we're waiting for is the impact for this CME. It will sideswipe Earth's magnetic field. So it's, it's kind of hard to predict, but they're saying nothing major, nothing more than a, uh, a geomagnetic storm of a G1. That's it. But 
<clears throat> nonetheless, I mean, we got a lot to talk about. Sunspot number is 84. All right, that's a huge jump in what we've been seeing. I, I mean, I'll admit this. We've been very quiet. Our sun has been in a very deep minimum for many years now. And to see it kind of wake up like this, there's a lot to go around here. So now we've got to start paying more attention to the the extreme weather events that were happening. And I think you'll see that here in tonight's show that we have definitely an uptick in those as well alongside with this weather, the space weather. As you see here at the website, thegrandsolarminimum.com, our space weather section shows you where we have that M-class flare and things have quietened down since. Now, uh, not to say that we're done because we have quite a few sunspots to still go over and maybe more on the way. There's a geomagnetic activity as you see, a little bit of an increase, but it's, things are calming down a little bit. KP indices are trending down as well. And that leads me to believe that, you know, what we're seeing in places like in Indonesia, where the Leo Tolo volcano has erupted. And talking to my good friend overseas, uh, David Birch. And he's the one that told me about a week and a half ago that uh, watch Indonesia, there is a big eruption on the way. Uh, we thought, or I thought, maybe Merapi, because we've been talking about that as well. And then this happens at 50,000 feet. There's still more discussed about that. But this is what we're looking at when we're trying to figure out what kind of sunspot activity that we're going to have in the future. And if you guys have followed this channel, for a little while. We we do this every time we do a show. And this is the first time, I think, since we've done this show, that we've ever seen the bright areas here from Earth facing to Eastern Limb and beyond. I'm not saying that this has never happened before. I'm saying this has never happened on our observation. We are Obviously, we've only been on since uh, 2016. Uh, that is... AR2791, Edward. <laughs> I saw the comment. I had to reply. That is AR2791 indeed that is behind me. So, but anyway, um, this is starting to show us the southern part of our star really is getting things underway. And if we look at the backside here, Here's the eastern limb. We've got another large area that is possibly producing uh, minor solar flares as well. And then we have more beyond that. Actually, that's what we had uh, the CME from. This is a new area. It's not as big and as bright, but again, to see this many in a row, and we already know there's two or three that are... Um, on the western limb of the star, and this back here, the black area is from Stereo B. We can't we we can't retrieve that information, unfortunately. So there's a pretty good chance right now that all around the southern ring of the uh, 30 degree area of our star, in the southern uh, part of our star, I should say, we know that things are definitely kicking up and starting to look like an uptick in solar activity. Now. Uh, lots to talk about, and I'm going to be doing a few more experimental questions and polls on my Twitter account, Jake GSM News, I believe. I think it's at Jake GSM News on Twitter. Uh, but I did a, I, I'm, I did a poll the other day, and I asked our listeners if sunspots contribute to temperature cooling or temperature increase. And it's just a yes or no. And then I invited folks to email me at jake, or I'm sorry, jake at thegrandsolarminimum.com. Email me your answers. And I'm not looking for right or wrong. I'm just looking to kind of get a sample of how people have been told about GSM. I know I was told a little bit differently. And I'm starting to feel um, like I understand the dynamo theory a little bit more than I did say four years ago. So a lot of things are starting to click and I'm just trying to raise awareness. And if I'm putting out wrong information, I want to make sure it's correct, but that's for another day. Um, 
I do believe I'm going to go ahead and try to reach out to Sarkova, Valentina Sarkova after the new year. And maybe we'll have a talk about sunspots. But to me, there's just a lot of questions that we still have. Just doing some light reading on my own. You know, I keep running into this phrase that the understanding of how the sun affects climate is low. And that that's everybody's go-to as far as like copping out. Well, we really don't know what the sun is controlling the climate. The understanding about that is still very low. And that's because there are so many complexities that are involved with sunspots, uh, the magnetic fields, everything that goes into this. So um, very interesting stuff that I've been kind of kicking around, just seeing how people answer uh, what they believe sunspots contribute to temperature cooling or warming. Um, and just curious to see what your answers are and then kind of put everything together like I said, I'm going to reveal more about this. Uh, I, I think uh, I need to wait until I get a hold of uh, Dr. Zarkova, though, and I want to hear her aspect of it because I, I know what she does is not really uh, involve the research of sunspots. She knows the basics, but at the same time, she almost puts it to me as if sunspots are just a symptom, an indicator, a bookmark for the solar cycles, and that's one of their main roles. So I don't know. Um, but interesting stuff. We'll keep looking at it and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do a video from time to time, update you. And uh, like I said, I'd like to talk to Zarkova about this before getting too crazy deep into this, because I, I sat and thought about it probably for a couple hours, drove Mari nuts about it too. But anyway, all right. So we're talking about all this space weather and just here recently before we went on the air, we had two strong earthquakes. We had a 6.4 in a part of Russia. Let's see if we can get a better look at it. It's the light blue one. All right, let's zoom in. And this is the part of Russia that was affected, the light blue dot. So right now, there's no tsunami warning out or anything like that. We haven't seen anything, but it was a deep earthquake for sure. Uh, 6.4 magnitude earthquake. And again, this just happened with a depth of about 587 kilometers. So again, a deep earthquake off the coast of Russia. Then, uh, well, actually, I think the one in Chile happened first, but according to USGS, these are seconds apart. Uh, both of them at 1754. The Chile one was in... Um, 1754 and 59 seconds, and the one in Russia was 15, 1754, 34 seconds. Guys, these were seconds apart. Two strong earthquakes, and of course, we're probably still seeing some shaking out there. This one, not as deep, 147.8 kilometers, but so two earthquakes within seconds. Okay, here's where I'm going with this, guys. All this activity going on right now. So do sunspots and corona holes and CMEs and all that have an immediate impact on Earth's magnetic field? It could. And to me, it just seems a little, you know, everything's lining up once again. We're getting some sunspot activity, a couple of radio brownouts, nothing major, but a few radio brownouts from, you know, we've had two eruptions, CMEs, not as strong as this one. This one here is the strongest we've seen in over three years. So it's definitely making news, but it's also, I think we're seeing, you know, the effects from it. And not just the two earthquakes, but the volcano activity that we're having. And I hope I'm saying this right here. Uh, forgive me if I'm not the Levotolo. Levo Tolo, I think the Levo Levo Tolo volcano, I believe here. Okay, explosive activity continues at Levo Tolo after major eruption on November 29th. That was yesterday. And we're talking about uh, the eruption yesterday that went 50,000 feet, that raised the aviation color code as well from a three to a four. 
there were no reports of injuries or damages after the major eruption on Sunday, but authorities confirmed nearly almost 3,000 people from 28 villages on the slopes of the volcano were evacuated nearby an airport that was close to the area where there was reported ash fall. So, and then today, not only did we have the 50,000 foot eruption yesterday, but today we are continuing to see eruption. And today's ash plume only reached around 13,000 feet tops. So a much weaker ash plume, but some activity, and this is out here in Indonesia. And like I said, uh, Starman, David Birch and I were having a, a good conversation. And, you know, he was warning me about that. We got some stuff that's about to pop off in Indonesia. And I initially thought Merapi, and here we are, um, the Liwo Tolo volcano, popping off a 50,000 footer the next day at 13,000, not as big, but still an uptick in volcanic and seismic activity. And I do believe that the last time we did a broadcast, we were talking about how we are starting to see this uptick in volcanic and earthquake activity. And it's because we're seeing the sun starting to produce CMEs, more sunspot activity, solar flares. That affects our magnetic field. And when you look at solar wind speeds that are coming in at over 500 plus kilometers per second, and the density is right around 13.4, that's that's a that's thicker than usual. So the, the right now, the magnetosphere is getting pounded. Our atmosphere is getting inundated by cosmic radiation at that thick of a density with that wind speed, and it's only going to go up. Uh, that's going to inundate the atmosphere with tons of highly charged particles, and they are just going to collect and build. And that's why. Are we, are we see our cosmic radiation doses are already up at 9.8%, 9.8%. That's up 0.8% in seven days. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. You can get this information on spaceweather.com, but I have it here at the bottom of your screen. You'll see space weather station today plus 9.7%. That is the cosmic rays dosage. And then right below it will tell you the seven day rolling average increase or decrease. If you see the plus sign, that's up. The minus sign means it's down. Right now, we are up 0.8 over the past seven days. So, increased cosmic radiation, highly charged particles are inundating our atmosphere. All right. We've got lots of action on the star. Pretty good sunspot number 84. I mean, I didn't expect it to get that high that quick, but we are seeing an uptick. So you, you factor that in, we just had two really strong earthquakes off the coast of Russia and one that was actually in the mountainous terrain of uh, Chile. Or was that, oh, I'm sorry, maybe I'll have to go back and look at that again. In the Argentina area right here. So again, all related to solar activity and the research is there. I know several pages that carry tons of links. What's up with that? Um, has tons of solar links that you could look into that will tell you about the correlations and connections with our magnetic field and earthquake and volcanic activity. Also, um, other pa pages with sources, no trick zones. Of course, tons of papers about cooling there. And we try to resource as well, so we have a few links on our resources page as well here on the grandsolarminimum.com. So with all that being said, now we talked about the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the inundation of cosmic rays. What does that do to the atmosphere? Well, I'll show you what it does. Widespread flooding hits Kuwait after six months worth of rain in just several days. Heavy rains have fallen over the past few days in Kuwait, resulting in flooded roads, schools, homes, and hospitals. Al Siberia received the highest amount of rain around 5.2 inches or about six times the average rainfall for the month of November. Heavy rains have been started, I think it went back as far as Saturday. And as of today, we're sitting at 5.2. Now this is six times the amount of rain that they get 
in a year. <laughs> what causes that, right? Obviously, and, and here's where AGW likes to hijack the topic and say, yep, here we go, man-made global warming, it's causing all this rain, but they can't back it up the science. Cosmic radiation, cloud nucleation, increased moisture, precipitation, snow, rain, you name it, hail. I said hail, not hell. But every time we do a live broadcast, it feels like that I'm doing a, 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 an article that talks about, you know, three times a month of rain in a few hours. And it's not just here in Kuwait. Widespread damaging hits, uh, floods hit Sao Paulo after a month's worth of rain in just one hour. Oh, so here we go. 5.4 inches of rain, which is the average rainfall for a month, which guys, that's a lot. And it happened in an hour. I mean, obviously it's flooded pretty bad here. Let's see if we got a lot of footage. I don't like to show the footage. Sometimes we get these weird copyright things. So, but go to watchers.news, but look at how high the water is here, guys. Look at this. That car is totally engulfed. There is a, a wall there. Jeez. And again, what causes that kind of drop of rain and, and that quick? Our atmosphere is fluxed. It's super fluxed from what I just showed you on space weather compared to what we've seen over the past several months where the sun's done nothing. This is a lot uh, to take in. And again, we're still seeing high rates of cosmic radiation, even though we're seeing more sunspots, we're still seeing more space weather that affects Earth's climate, especially on the extreme side. So just something to look at too, folks. Massive floods claim three lives. Unfortunately, in Sardinia, a rare tornado hits Catania. Uh, Cat is that Catania? Catania? Catania. Yeah, Italy. Good place. But again, look at the footage. More rain. And, in, and again, this was probably a couple of months worth of rain in a short period of time. I'm sure of it. So three major floods across the pond here. Kuwait, South America, and now here in Italy. Three big storms globally. Thankfully, the U.S. is not experiencing stuff like this. But across the Gulf Coast right now, we are seeing quite a bit of rain. And there is flooding from that as well. But again, this is not a coincidence. When we see the space weather that is increasing like it has and we get more ingredients in the atmosphere like we have. And look, we got to watch for this uh, possible effects from the CME on December 1st and 2nd. So we're not out of the woods yet. <clears throat> and it's getting late here on the East Coast. We're almost at the December 1st. So is this some of this earthquake activity? Is this part of... That CME that will sideswipe our magnetic field, who knows? But the, the solar wind speed that coming in right now, bringing in a thick stream, uh, a plasma, these dense, highly charged particles are really going to continue to fuel storms like I just showed you here. And we can expect more earthquakes and more volcanic action for the weeks to come if this pattern continues. And right now, you know, I just don't see why the sun just stops producing these sun. And, and, of course, the northern part of this is going to flare up eventually. But it is making up for its late start, definitely. Solar Cycle 25 officially got underway around July, mid-July, late July. And you can say that it was a slow start. Still pretty blank. We were still considering deep minimum conditions in September. We had a brief bit of a kick up. July into August, and then it just died out September, October, and then November. We are starting to see things once again pick up, as they should, as we uptick through this solar cycle, the very young and early part of this solar cycle as well. All right, so we've got the storms all across there. Winter-like cold blasts here in the U.S., so if you like cold, well, it's here. Unseasonably cold air will plunge into the south, ushering the lowest temperature reading since last winter. 
and even some record-challenging cold, the blasts of which were air followed by a weather system that triggered stormy weather and threatened to bring severe storms to the region on Sunday into Monday. Uh, behind this potent storm will be a rush of cold air, Arctic air, that will infiltrate as far south as the Gulf Coast and part of the Florida Peninsula. Yeah, that's happening. The cold plunge already quite noticeable in portions of Texas and Oklahoma. Monday morning, Oklahoma City and Dallas and Houston are just a few cities that have already dipped to their lowest marks since late last spring as the cold air took hold early on Monday. And check out what we're looking at here in the south. That's pretty significant. 20 to 30, 10 to 20 degrees lower in the dirty south, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia. We'll, we'll call Tennessee as part of the dirty south, at least the southern part. And then you go even far north, as almost as Tampa, 10 to 20 degrees cooler. Folks, yeah, that's cold. And the reason why the, there are a lot of people in Florida right now is because they're getting away from this cold, but yet they're not going to escape it. I know, um, what's his name? Spaghetti Models. Mike over there at SpaghettiModels.com, he's ready. He, he's excited for the cold weather. He actually had some pictures of himself on Facebook with the hat. He's ready to go. Gloves, sleeves, you name it. His long johns. But on Tuesday and Tuesday night, the core of cold air will shift farther to the east. A forecast of low of 31 in Charleston, South Carolina, will be right around its typical first freeze date. And I, that brings me to this as well. Um, just because I'm reporting on some colder than a normal, un, you know, unseasonably cold to this part of the country, um, it's an anomaly. All right? I'm not trying to say, you know, hijack this for grand solar minimum. But what I will say is I feel like, it, at least if you lived in New York and in the Northeast, it feels like we've actually had all four seasons. So nothing too drastic this year heading into the 2020 winter season. Now, the Mountain Northwest may argue with us on that and the Northern Plains. Uh, they have had some pretty cold air, and we have also seen some pretty significant storms as well in those areas. But right now, I feel like the season's kind of trending along, which makes me a little nervous. Usually, it's in like a lamb and out like a lion, and right now, it just feels like there's going to be some buildup, and we'll get into that when we look at our GFS outlook. But they're talking about feet of lake effect snow right now uh, in parts well, let's take a look. Right along Lake Erie, northeastern Ohio, just outside of Cleveland, is where the heaviest of snow is going to be through Erie, Pennsylvania, into the south towns of Buffalo, all up and down the I-90 corridor. So look out. Here is some more lake effect snows for this area. This will be the most significant one of the season thus far. Uh, anywhere from a foot to a foot and a half. Uh, some isolated areas could see up to 36 inches of snow. And looking at this map, I'd have to say Erie, Pennsylvania, and parts near Cleveland, Ohio, believe it or not, you guys might have the best chance at getting the 36 inches of snow. Uh, so Ohio, most of you will see one to three inches of snow at least if not more. Actually, this map is indicating three to six inches of snow, uh, and that system is pretty massive, so that's a possibility. So this is their first significant snow of the year, 2020, for Ohio. And uh, I know some of you folks out there were kind of happy to see this, getting you in the Christmas spirit. Folks in the northeastern part of Ohio are already used to this, so um, you know, time to get those snow blowers out. And yeah, that stuff is going to be heading your way too. Thankfully, here in the Northeast, though, nothing like that in the foreseeable near future. Let's take a look at the forecast here. This is right now into late night, and that you'll still see the snow pretty much all over Ohio into by morning, still lightening up a little bit, tapering down by mid-morning in Ohio. Erie, Pennsylvania, Cleveland, Ohio, still lots of snow, and especially for Cleveland, Erie gets more overnight Tuesday into Wednesday morning and right on up the western coastline oh I'm sorry western part of New York Buffalo and the south towns will get their snow uh, Tuesday into Wednesday Wednesday night before it finally moves out 
and some light snow across the upstate part region of New York. Vermont, New Hampshire could see some light snow as well. But this is fast acting and moving on quick. Higher pressure coming into the area will bring colder air, but also dry things out just a little bit. And I believe that's why that snow does fizzle out by Thursday. But the flakes will be flying here in the northeast thanks to that little low pressure system that Ohio is experiencing right now. More cold air across the United States, and you know what this is, right, guys? Look at this dip. This cold front is very bizarre. And when you see a cold front like that, you're usually talking about high pressure near Greenland causing a high Greenland block. I have to look now just because whenever I see things like that, and I'm not saying I this is for sure. I'm just, you know, I've, there's a lot of things that I've learned on my own as well. So let's take a look at where we are on December. There it is. So we do have high pressure. Let's check though. Let's, let's make double sure of that. Uh, yeah, Northern Hemisphere, December 4th. Check that out. There it is. There's your high pressure. When, when you have high pressure near Greenland, right here, and you got it up here as well, okay, this usually is in the ingredients of a Greenland block. And, I, I mean, another reason what kind of led me to believe that we were going to experience this as well is that dip in the jet stream. So when you see these weird oblong you know, situations here, Usually, that's a good indication that we've got some high pressure up near Greenland that's causing some problems. So, there you have it. Um, and then moving through the week, next week, more snow possible for the Northeast by next weekend, December 5th. Rain across the south into Florida along the I-95 corridor as well. Massachusetts, Boston, looking like a rainy weekend next weekend, this coming weekend, I should say. Then a little minor system kind of flares up across the mid-Atlantic states here, parts of Virginia and North Carolina. We could see some snow in the higher elevations, but still going to watch this system. It's Right now, it's trending away from the U.S., and temperatures wouldn't be cold enough for much snow. But just interesting to see if this thing does trend in more inland uh, in forecasts to come. Here we are, December 7th. More cold for the Northeast, light snow, nothing major. Again, pretty quiet for most of the United States. And here we are December 8th. Uh, we're looking at temperatures right around average, a little bit colder in the north, but nothing major. High pressure dominating the U.S., keeping things dry. The Northeast is looking like that it might experience several rounds of light snow, one to three here, three to five there. This one looks like one of the three to fives for most of us here in New York and parts of Vermont and New Hampshire. Moving forward into Friday, that's next weekend, snow along the northern Plain states, and then it invades the northeast. And this system here on December 12th could produce uh, upstate New York and Vermont and New Hampshire. This might be our first significant snow system moving through. And guys, I can't tell you what a classic La Nina prop pattern we have right here. Look at this. Absolutely classic La Nina. And it's only right before the middle of December. So right on cue, here comes the effects. We're starting to see snow building up. Temperatures are definitely going to be trending to that as well. So we're not going to have our issue with it not sticking when it does hit. And then December 13th, that thing kind of lingers there in a little bit. Another system moving across the United States on the 14th. Ohio Valley might get hit again, three to five inches possible, before it breaks up into the northeast. Light snow for the Great Lakes area, Erie, PA, Buffalo, and the South Towns. Some scattered snow across the northeast after that. But then here in the middle of the month, December 15th, the northwest has a pretty significant system that moves in and could drop lots of snow. And the looks of this front dropping. As, as south as it is, we're seeing snow in parts of Arizona, California, guys, even near Los Angeles, no lie, upper elevations, but still snow possible, lots of cold air. It's going to ridge a little bit for uh, the East Coast, but very, very weak, in my opinion, just looking at the early models. And then right on the uh, middle of the month, the models are kind of showing us that we might have something a brewing 
with another major winter system. Lots of cold air in place across the northwest and the northern plains and, of course, the Great Lakes region in the northeast. Most of the warmth is staying below. So let's check out temperatures. How are we going to look? Um, well, again, I can't say that this is above or below. This looks about normal for me. The majority of the warmth is gone. We are pushing through with 30s and 40s and 50s from the far south, 20s and 30s by the mid-month. And then we start to see that darker purple. That's that really cold Arctic air that's already trying to push its way in. Look at that at the very end of this run. So we're already talking about pushing in some very large areas of cold air into the United States by the middle of December. Let's take a look at it here, the big picture. And you'll see it too, guys. After about the 12th of December, there is a lot of colder Arctic air that's building up that just gets released. But here we are on the 7th of December, and now we start to see those brighter pinks moving farther southward. And then this just shoots down right here on the 11th of December into the 12th, a huge extension there of some deep, colder air as it builds and continues to flow through the northern parts of Canada. And then by the time we get to the 17th, we're talking about another possibility of a big push of an Arctic freeze. But look at Greenland, suspectly. It's like we take all that cold out of here. This recharges. Will it blow up into bright, bright purple and pink colors like we saw here? Because if you look at this here, every time it goes from pink to to that, it's reloading, it's recharging, and then more cold Arctic air forms and pushes into the circle and then down into Canada and eventually into the lower 48. So things are looking pretty normal if you ask me, but we are starting to see colder air building into Canada and pushing further south. Uh, let's also look at snowfall totals. Uh, right now, Ohio looking at two to three inches for the most of you in southwestern Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, parts of southeastern as well. Heavier amounts are going to be up near the lakes, Erie. Right now, they're talking about a foot at least for the south towns of Buffalo, Cleveland, uh, Erie, PA. And as we move towards the middle of the month, more snow in the northeast than anywhere else in the U.S., a couple storms here and there at the middle part of the month, we start to see more action of snowfall at the end of uh, well, the 16th. We'll start to see more snowfall in the northwest. So right now we're going to see a couple clipper sy systems across the northeast for a few days. Nothing major, and but it does indicate that we are getting into winter type weather. And uh, from the looks of it, we could see quite the winter as far as cold and snow goes for most of us here across the northern plains northwest mountain range into the ohio valley in my opinion into the northeast uh far south so ice storms across uh kentucky tennessee and the far south as well still lots to uh report on as well winter is only getting started it hasn't even begun yet and we're starting to see weather-like patterns settling here as we are getting into the month of december we're looking forward to Roy Spencer's uh, release on the temperatures as well as for the UAH. We're looking at La Nina 1.276. This is below baseline. Uh, we are at a very moderate La Nina strength right now. It could get stronger as right now the trend is showing that it is starting to decline once again. So to be continued, we don't have the full effect of what's going to happen this winter yet, but things are really pointing here, at least in the parts that I just mentioned in the U.S., there could be some very cold and snowy days here for parts of the U.S. And then hopefully, you know, for the sake of our friends across seas who do, who do enjoy the snow, your winter gets going as well. I want to say hello to Matt Bros. Good to see you out there. Very enthusiastic gardener. Richard, good to see you out there from New Mexico. Ben Garcia. Edward, thanks for tuning in as well. Uh, a few others out there. If I didn't catch your names, I apologize. But I see lots of uh, familiar faces, knife collectors out there, Tug Ta, thank you as always. We appreciate all your support, much, much appreciated, as we will continue to provide you with the most updated GSM news that we could possibly provide for everyone out there. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, we will talk soon. Take care, everyone.
Do you like this show? Give us a thumbs up. Want to support us more? Share to your favorite social media platform. Buy a t-shirt or become a Patreon. All links are in the description below. 